So this is the first lecture about uh, cryptographic hash functions. So a hash function satisfies several purposes. And I'll first start talking about just what hash functions are in general. It's a general concept that computer scientists are familiar with. For a mathematician, it's just a function from a larger input space to a sort of output space. Now, the problems you want to get is that we have sort of a short handle on a larger piece of data. So you have your big files, you have like your photo collection, and you want to have something so that you can figure out whether you have or you had that picture in your album or not, in a way that you don't have to compare pixel by pixel, but you have some short well, fingerprint or handle for each piece of data. And, well, you might be taking two pictures which are very similar, like you're taking portraits and you're smiling a little more or a little less, or you're taking a scene in nature and it doesn't change that much, but you do want to distinguish those pictures because afterwards you want to go and pick the nicest of the 10 moonshine pictures or whatever you have sitting around. And so you want a small change in your data leads to a very different handle. So you have a different fingerprint and can easily disambiguate, can easily figure out whether you have this unique file. And it should be unique now, of course, uh, just from a magnitude argument that's impossible if you have a short handle, say 128 or 256 bits, then you can have at most 250, 128, 228 or 256 different um, inputs that you can uniquely identify. But for all practical purposes, you're never going to see so much data. Even if you access it throughout your moonshine pictures, you will not get that many pictures. So it probably uniquely identifies it within the range of reasonable pictures. Also, you shouldn't be able to compute this fingerprint without having the whole data. So this is something which should touch every bit. Well, this is also like this, this modification leads to different, different fingerprint goes in this direction, but also it's a form of commitment. So when you um, say, yes, I can't tell you my answer yet, but I have the right answer. You can compute the hash, and afterwards you shouldn't be able to not have had the answer. So afterwards, when I ask you, okay, uh, well, now your homework is due, tell me what really was the answer, then you can't produce a matching uh, file without having had it at the time that you gave the commitment. Other purposes that hash functions are sometimes used for is that you get a sort of uniform distribution on the outputs. So you might want to use this for allocating storage, where to save a file. Or in principle, if I had lectured about hash functions before talking about the pivot row method, I could have said that the index, like the step that we take next, would be chosen by a hash function. So which step to take next in the, in the random walk there, that would typically be also the function of a hash function. Of course, there I said we have only 32 pre-computed values. 32 is a rather small number, so of course you will have overlaps. But in that case, you make use of the uniformity of the distribution. Also, it should be hard to go back. Again, information theoretically of a magnitude argument, you can't really go back because, I mean, it's a small thing. Say you're taking module 32, there's no way to recover the whole thing, but you shouldn't even be able to really recover any of the pictures. So let, let's make this a little bit more concrete, but let's stay still with the practical usage. So here are the definitions for cryptographic hash functions as you would use them in practice. So this is how we normally, well, in applied cryptography, we define a hash function like this. It's a standalone function, has parameters. It takes strings of arbitrary length. Okay, so actually sometimes you want to have group elements, sometimes I said your pictures, or you want to have a PDF file, a movie. But in the end, all of those on your computer get represented as zeros and ones. So the sequence of zeros and ones, so the set notation with a star on top, means it's strings or well, files which have just content zeros and ones, so bits, and the star indicates it has arbitrary length. So this input can be a, hand uh, a typed up letter, just a short five liner, or it can be a two hour long movie, or it can be a whole disk. No matter how long it is, it will all map to bit strings of length n. So on the right hand side, the zero, one to the n, the n there indicates the length of it. 
So the output of this hash function sits in the set of all length n bit strings. Okay, as a mathematician, you might prefer thinking of the output as the integers mod 2 to the n, but we're not going to use any of this mod 2 to the n structure. So it will be integers mod 2 to the n, but forgetting about the math. Now, a cryptographic hash function or a secure hash function, we have the following three requirements. So we want to have that it has pre image resistance, second pre image resistance, and collision resistance. Now I'll briefly go through what these different three properties are. But a cryptographic hash function is supposed to um, offer all three of those. Okay, these are all properties looking at the output, trying to figure out something about the input or multiple inputs to it. So pre-image resistance, we give an image. So Y is somewhere the output of the hash function. We apply the hash function to the whole input space. We don't know what was taken, but it was a valid input. Now your task is to find some input which gives that output. Now, if your hash function was just integers mod 32, that would be very, very easy. You could just say, okay, cross it's an integer. Uh, the output is also an integer, or you take add a multiple of 32. So that function is not a cryptographic hash function. So for a cryptographic hash function, it should be hard to do. So in this case, the Y, the image, is fixed and it is known uh, to the attacker or to the person who's challenged here. Uh, we also know that there exists some X and while well, your task is to find that X or some other X. I mean, there are many, many values on the input range, uh, on the input space. There are only two to the N on the output space. Fairly likely there exists more than one, but this one asks you to find one. And it should be computationally hard to find any of them. A second pre image resistance is very similar, but this time you don't just know the output, you know the input. You know an x, and well, once you know the x, you can compute the y that belongs to it. So figuring out the x is not going to be a hard problem. But now you want to find a second pre image, some other element that also maps here. So now this time, if this was an injective function, it would be impossible to compute second pre-images, whereas first pre-images could be easy. Again, given that I'm enforcing the infinitely large set for the input range, it can't be injective because the output range is finite. Um, but it should be computationally hard to find any x prime which is not equal to x and maps to the same output. So here the data flow is different. We first take the x that fixes the y, so in that sense it's similar to the part a, but in part a we don't know any pre-image and it's supposed to find one. Here we know one pre-image, but we don't know how to find another. And then finally collision resistance. Now collision resistance removes um, any of those restrictions, so this is the most flexible of the, of the properties. So we're allowed to choose any target that we're supposed to find any two inputs x and x prime, well not equal to one another, having the same output. Of course if you can find second pre-images, you just pick an x, you compute the output, you compute a second pre-image and now these two also form a collision. So if you can solve second pre-image resistance, you can also break collision resistance. But typically you can't break either of those. Now this last one has more flexibility, is less restrictive, so it's probably easier, and we'll quantify that on the next slide, but even that should be computationally hard. So you have to scale up your size, this n has to be sufficiently large that you do have collision resistance. So let's go through the generic hardness. So let's assume that we have, well, at least a decently distributed uh, hash function, so the, the output is uniformly distributed, and then whatever y you pick, so that's the output y, you're trying to figure out something that can be an input by, well, basically just brute forcing it. So you randomly pick x values. There are two to the n possible outputs, and each x value picks one. So each x has a one over two to the n chance of giving you the right y. 
So if you ask about the expected number of trials, well, it's the inverse of this. So you're expecting 2 to the n folds to h to find a free energy. So if your n is 256, which is a typical output length of hash function, that's a whole lot of folds. So 2 to the 256 folds to the hash function. You'll get older. You will get older with this. Add that sum. All right. Similarly, for second free images, you can also, well, you randomly sample some x, you have, well, x prime, you check that it's not the same as x, and you check whether the output is equal to uh, half an x, just randomly sample x prime, and you check whether the output matches the other one. Also, there you have a 1 over 2 to the n chance of being right, so you have to do 2 to the n calls. Now, for collisions, it's a little bit different. When we talk about the Pollard row method, I was talking a lot about the Bursley paradox and that you're taking, um, you're drawing elements at random from a restricted set of some number of elements. Now, in this case, they're 2 to the n elements, and the Bursley paradox, and I've also plotted it on the right up there. How this distribution happens. Uh, the most interesting part is to keep in mind that you have 50% probability um, of actually, well, finding a collision that's about here when you're at the square root of the group order and there is an extra pi over 2 out of the square root. So on the, on the grand scheme of things, that is a square root attack, so instead of taking 2 to the n, it's taking the square root or written as 2 to the n over 2 calls to find a collision. And in the next talk, I'll talk a bit about how we do this in practice, because it's going to be another application of the Paul Drow method. Um, but what you see on this graph here, and I maybe could have included this also for the Paul Drow method, is that if you're much earlier, your chance is much, much lower, and then comes some new part, which does increase pretty quickly. And then, yeah, you're most of the way there. Getting 100%, yeah, okay, then you're far out here. Once you have more than 365 people, or <laughs> the peers, 366 people in one room, you will have duplications. So you have a guarantee that there is a collision of birthdays. And similarly, once you have two to the n um, choices, then you guarantee to have a collision. But there's a pretty steep incline around here. So that's where the 50% is sitting, and then just getting in this range is getting you quite a lot of knowledge. But do note, this is much, much lower than the other ones. It's a scroll of the other ones because of this freedom in choosing a target. So pre much resistance, second pre much resistance are much more restrictive than collision resistance. But for passing the sanity check of being a cryptographic hash function, the function still has to satisfy collision resistance. Nowadays, we try to design systems so that they only rely on pre image or second pre image resistance. But several of the older schemes still rely on collision resistance. And so, well, it's one of the properties we do want to have achieved. Now, just to sum up for this introductory lecture about hash functions, um, so these are the highest possible complexities we can hope for. This is kind of idealized. So, a good hash function will have this. On the next slide, I've sh I'm showing you what the current state of the art is. So, let's start at kind of off the middle here. So. These guys here, those are in use and probably okay. In cryptography, there is no certainty, so probably okay is <laughs> the best you can get out of me, unless it's something which is really absolutely proven to be secure. But these ones are in use and we don't see any weakness. So the number here, 26 or 384, 512, that gives you the length of the output, that gives you the n. And so nothing really small happens there. And then the SHA-3, SHAKE, and other SHA-3 finalists, those are more recent designs, also with 384 and all There's an older function called SHA-1. Um, you can still find this when you uh, check out the Git repository. There's an experimental patch for using SHA-256, but SHA-1 is the default and definitely for all the old repositories. But in 2017, we have seen a collision. Now we have seen some more practical attacks, and collisions have been kind of coming since 2004. So it takes a lot of time for cryptographers and for practitioners to get rid of bad functions. Most extreme cases are the MD4 and MD5 family of, of hash functions, 
So MD5, yeah, there were already weaknesses known in 1995-96, but it really took till 2004 till somebody showed how you can efficiently compute collisions um, to get the uh, practitioners to wake up. And even then it was just like, yeah, but it hasn't really broken anything. So then 2008 uh, was a show the prefix collision, which got to something more practically broken. And then flame malware in 2012, that was still finding a place in the Windows operating system that was using MD5 in a security critical manner. And the attackers used MD5 collisions um, to get malware deployed. MD4 at that point was no longer used, uh, but MD5 was unfortunately still used uh, in signatures. Now signatures is a topic we're going to cover next, and this is going back to my big overview of um, like what's, what's the general schedule here is we have now dealt with how else and Rob can share key without having met, and now we're going into uh, signatures which are to ensure that they're actually talking to the right party, so that you're really talking to my web page when you think you're and so that falls in the area of public key signatures. We have briefly seen um, key derivation functions. So that was one of the topics in the Diffie key exchange that I said, okay, Alice and Bob compute A times B times this point. And then, um, well, the next level down doesn't take this point, but takes a key derivation function from it. And a very typical key derivation function would be just to take bit representation of the group element and to hash it. So that's another use of hash function. And then the next thing we're going to do is symmetric cryptography, where we're looking at how we transfer the bulk of the, of the data. And of course, at that point, we also want to make sure that this data is protected against modification and comes from the right person. And so that is also a use of hash functions. So people sometimes call this the Swiss Army knife of cryptography because hash functions get used basically.